Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the next in our Expert Series podcast. And today uh, is titled Crude Oil Economics and Energy Policy, What Happens When They Don't Agree? And we are uh, pleased to once again welcome Mr. Ed Hurst as our expert speaker. Ed is CFO for DJ Resources, an independent E&P company that's been one of the leaders of the Nibrero play in the Denver Basin. Ed has worked in corporate finance in Houston since 1982, and he began his illustrious career with internships and consulting assignments with Mobile Oil and the U.S. Department of Energy. Ed teaches a course called Economics of Energy at the University of Houston, and he's taught there since 1988. In addition, he's taught finance at Rice and econometrics at Yale. Ed is a CFA charter holder, and he's received his BA, MA in economics, and his MBA from Yale, where he also chairs a national energy conference. So welcome, Ed. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, let's take a look at U.S. energy policy today and the current goals of the administration. You know, number one, we want to improve electricity transmission. This, this, of course, doesn't have much to do with crude oil, but it's important to put it into the context of current policy. We want to double the supply of renewable energy, eliminate carbon emissions, establish an efficient natural gas transmission system, and we want to eliminate dependence upon foreign crude. In the U.S., it's important to note that crude oil is used primarily for transportation and also as a feedstock for the manufacture of chemicals and plastics. So what have been some of the past policies? Well, one of the, the, the tremendous ones was, of course, instituted during the Eisenhower administration, a mandatory crude oil import quota. Eisenhower recognized the national security issues related to a secure source of, of crude oil, and so imports were limited. During this period of time, U.S. prices were generally as much as double world oil prices. The swing producer was not Saudi Arabia. The swing producer was the state of Texas. In the 70s, during the Nixon administration, this mandatory crude oil import quota was abandoned as we ran into a tremendous run of inflation and as the production in the United States began to be maxed out. We began to access more of the foreign crude supplies that were available. These crude prices uh, uh, then became, began to dominate the U.S. economy. And in response to the inflation, we began to see U.S. oil companies having price controls placed on their production move offshore to develop foreign supplies. In 1973, due to the issues relating to the embargoes, the United States began to develop the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. This would have enough oil perhaps to replace maybe 20% of our current consumption for maybe four months if we drew it down all at one point. It's not so much an economic reserve as it is perhaps a national security reserve. So let's go ahead and take a look. What would energy independence cost? And in particular, we're talking about crude oil. We are energy independent as far as natural gas is concerned, and we're certainly energy independent as far as coal and electricity uh, are concerned. So currently, we're consuming about 17 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, approximately 7 million of that is related to um, uh, plastics uh, and, and chemicals production. The remainder is related to uh, transportation. This is off significantly from 2007, primarily due to the recession. And so what, what does this cost us? Well, let's say it's 13 million barrels of oil per day at $60 a barrel. This is approximately $241 billion a year of foreign exchange that goes running out the door. So what if we tried to replace this? If the near-term elasticity of demand for oil is about minus 0.11, then you would see a 1% increase in price is only going to drop the demand by 0.1%. Oil is very inelastic. The, the doubling of the price is not going to make many of us stop uh, commuting to work. You know, no one ever lost their job because of the increased price of gasoline. The, the elasticity of supply is similarly relatively inelastic. It's, it's very difficult to bring more crude oil onto production very quickly. And so if we extrapolate and say, let's take out all the foreign supplies, we may wind up with a price of, per barrel in the United States 
of as much as $240 a barrel. This would translate to approximately $12 per gallon at the pump, which, which would be painful. We would all start carpooling again, maybe riding bicycles. Where would the new supply come from? We know that biofuels is supposed to provide 2 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. This is under the new mandates that have been passed over the last several years by, by the, the Congress and the administrations. Um, potentially, this comes from biodiesel, ethanol, uh, substitutes that are readily uh, available in the United States. Uh, conservation, we may be able to get as much as 4 million barrels of oil equivalent per day over the next decade, and this would be an improvement in our transportation infrastructure. Um, where would other supplies come from? Coal to liquids is a technology that's been used in Africa for decades. Uh, gas to liquids is a technology that's being used in Qatar. New oil supplies domestically could come online from conventional and unconventional resources, such as tar sands and shale oil. Uh, these become, uh, these of course are, are higher marginal cost resources, but with a price of oil in excess of, of $200 per barrel, these become very economic. You know, in fact, the Department of Energy now forecasts crude oil prices in the next decade of well over $150 per barrel under just simply business as usual. Now, what do we have in terms of access to domestic supply? Now, here's a piece. The government of the United States under the present administration has withdrawn oil lands from entry in order to conserve this asset. Well, this is obviously an age-old problem. The economics of exhaustible resources by, by Stanford professor Harold Hotelling, he wrote in 1931. And so one of the, the questions facing the country is, how do we husband our resources for our own benefit? And with 94% of world oil reserves controlled by other nations, not ours, and these guys are all acting in their best interest, maybe it's time we start to act more in our own interest, not just for national security reasons, but also for domestic economic purposes. Back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Ed. That was a, a truly thought-provoking presentation, and you're right, the uh, $12 per gallon of gas does sound very painful. So a quick word uh, from our sponsor, WellPoint Systems. Uh, our goal is to deliver software solutions and services that transform complex data into business insight. Our systems are used by more than 450 oil and gas companies in 60 countries. You may be aware of some of the award-winning products like Bolo, Ideas, Energy Financial Management, and Energy Bro Broker, but also the fact that we serve asset-intensive industries, aerospace, process manufacturing, mining, public sector, uh, public se sector and a few others with our Daxium Access Maintenance Solutions. And just want to point out that in addition to other expert series podcasts, including another one that Ed Hers did for us on a natural gas policy, we have uh, things like a special white paper called From Chaos to Confidence in Oil and Gas Finance and Operations, and also plenty of other offers available at wellpointsystems.com. So with that, I want to say a special thank you to our expert speaker, Ed Hers, and we much appreciate your being with us today. Thanks, Chris.